It's a pleasure to be introducing our next speaker, Brother Bruce Stulting. I think everybody here knows that we came to know one another when he came to be a student at the Southwest School of Bible Studies when I was the director and teaching there. Bruce certainly showed, and I don't know that I've said this to you, Bruce, but one of the things, and you know how we all are watching one another, <laughs> uh, one of the great things about Bruce was to watch him grow and to develop in the true sense of what it was to be converted to Christ and seeing him grow in the school, but then much more than that, seeing continue to grow as a gospel preacher and certainly his love for the truth and supported by Sue, his good wife, and the good things they've done. He was born in Carn City, Texas, and graduated from the Southwest School of Bible Studies in 1989. He was a participant in the graduate program that Memphis School of Preaching offered in 98 to 2000, and he's done mission work in the Philippines. In fact, I, we hadn't seen one another in a long, long time, and all of a sudden we met up in Manila, so it's strange what you can, how you meet people. But anyway, he also has worked in Cambodia. He held, has held gospel meetings, he speaks on lectureships, conducted evangelistic campaigns in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri, and worked with several Bible youth camps, served on the faculty of the Rose City Bible Learning Center in Little Rock, Arkansas, when he was there, of course. Done local work in Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas. Been working with the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville since 2001. And he serves there, as I said earlier, as one of the elders. Bruce also works for the Texas Department of Transportation and is married to the former Sue Bemis. And again, I count them dear friends. And for Bruce's standpoint, a stalwart soldier of the cross who I don't believe will compromise for family or friends or anybody else when it comes to the whole counsel of God and that he certainly preaches and we're looking forward to him preaching at this time as I've announced on the indestructibility of the church. Brother Bruce, come speak to us. I appreciate you letting me preach till 12 o'clock. We really don't need that 10-minute break since we're going right into lunch after this lesson. Being a wise and, and logical and being a, a wise and logical and reasonable elder such as you are, I'm sure you would see the purpose behind that. <laughs> All right. You know, David mentioned that we met at, first met at the, Southwest School of Bible Studies when I went there as a student. What he doesn't know is that prior to becoming a Christian, I went to the Shenandoah Lectures, and uh, I don't think we met there, but I met a man named Tommy Davidson, which if David remembers him very well, he and I talked about him just recently. And Tommy Davidson is just the nicest man you'd ever want to meet. And uh, he had a display there promoting the school. So I went over there and was looking at the display and talking to Tommy and I signed up thinking that I was going to get some more information about the school. Well, I didn't know that I was signing up to go to school. <laughs> I'm not even a Christian at this time. And I've already signed up to go to preacher training school. So Roger, the preacher at the congregation where I'm attending that eventually converted Sue and I, uh, gets a call from David and says, hey, one of your members uh, signed up to come to school. And he said, well, which one? Because, like, Roger's like, we ain't got nobody here who wants to go to that school. And uh, he tells him Bruce Stolting, and Roger's false teeth came out, I think. He said, he's not even a member of the church. So... About just a few months after I was baptized, I went to preacher training school where I met David and uh, haven't looked back since. David uh, has been a good inspiration for me in all my preaching life, my Christian life. It's been a big influence on me. Appreciate him a great deal and the good work that he's doing here with the other rest of the elders of this congregation. 
It's good to know that this congregation is here, that it's sound, that it's been sound and it's been unwavering in its support of the truth for as long as I can remember. The good work that you brethren have been doing for years has really helped influence the brotherhood and will continue to do so uh, as long as the written page stands and the internet is here. These lessons will continue to do good long into the future. My lesson, the indestructibility of the church, I think the best place to start is Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades or, liter or, or hell, the King James Version, literally Hades shall not prevail against it. We think about the church. Uh, the, the question really if we're talking about the indestructibility of the church, does the church exist in the world today? If the church is truly indestructible, then it's, it's here. We can find it. If his church, if the church of Christ is not on earth today, then no church has a divine right to exist. In Matthew chapter 18, or, or chapter 28 and verse 20, Jesus Talking about making disciples, once you make the disciples, just teach them to observe all things whatsoever I command thee, and lo, I am with you to the end of the world. Talking Again, both of these passages talking about the indestructibility, the permanence, the permanent nature of the church. If the church of Christ doesn't exist, then every church in existence today is of human origin and is not worth anything. All would, everyone that wants to be re religious, that would like to follow Christ, would be in the wrong church. They would be in a denomination. And if it is in existence, we ought to be able to find it. And if it is in existence, then the question is, how can we find it? This involves the question of church succession. Can any church trace itself to the New Testament? You know, I've had a member of the Catholic Church said, you know, we can trace our church all the way back to Peter. And I said, you know, I can trace mine all the way back to Jesus. You see, it's not really necessary to be able to trace the church all the way back to the cross in an unbroken chain. Now, it is an admitted fact that the church existed during the times of the apostles. We can read about it on the pages of the New Testament. Has the church existed in every generation? Is it in existence now? And can it be identified? That's the, the, really the substance of what we're talking about here when we talk about the indestructibility of the church. And I have 14 passages of Scripture that I want to read right quick. We're not going to spend much time on this. But I want to get these in front of us at the very beginning of this lesson because this is going to be the foundation upon which we speak for the rest of our time. In the Old Testament, in Psalm 145 and verse 13, it says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. In other words, the kingdom of God is going to exist in every generation. Exodus 15 and verse 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. The term forever sometimes means to the end of a time, a time period, or end of an age. Sometimes you'll read about something lasting forever, and then you read later on in the Bible that that ended. In what sense was it forever then? Well, it was forever until the end of that time period, or that era. When you see the term forever and ever, that means eternal. That means unending. Psalm 9 and verse 7, the Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment. 
Psalm 45 and verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. There's the idea again. The scripture of thy kingdom is a righteous scepter. Lamentations 5 and verse 19. Thou, O Lord, remains forever thy throne for generation to generation. Isaiah 9 and verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Daniel 2 and verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. It's not going to be left to other people. You know the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed never to regain its prominence as a world power. But there was always a remnant. The kingdom of Christ is not going to be that way. It's going to be established and it's going to exist forever and ever. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 3. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 14. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion shall, uh, which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7 and verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. Now that's the Old Testament. The New Testament, Revelation, uh, uh, yeah, Revelation chapter one and verse six, and it made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. There's that phrase forever and ever again. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. 2 Peter 1 and verse 11. And so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. The scriptures are very explicit when it comes to the indestructible nature of the kingdom. Once the kingdom was established, it would never be destroyed, but would stand forever. We've already read from our text in, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he promised to build his church. And in connection with this promise, he pledged the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. The expression shall not prevail against it may signify not prevent its establishment. Or it could signify that it will never be demolished. Both may be included. In fact, in the uh, prophecy in which John foretold the persecution of the church under the figure of a woman, he declared, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God. Revelation 12 and verse 6. The image, imagery here would appear to suggest that even in times of hardship and during intense persecution, we see in, in Revelation 11 and verse 2 and chapter 13 and verse 5, even during those times, Christ's church would not become extinct. You know, when we think about history, 
Prior to the invention of the printing press in 1440, Gutenberg Press, it's hard to have established records prior to that time. But it's interesting that people like Keith Seisman and others, I have other sources, but I'm going to read a quote from him in just a second. Since the printing press was invented, there are records to show that brethren have existed in the 1400s, the 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s, the 1800s, all the way to the present. We can verify that because we have written records preserved. Keith Seisman, in the introduction to his book, he says it has often been asked whether churches of Christ existed prior to the 19th century America restoration movement of Barton Stone and Alexander Campbell. If churches of Christ built on biblical foundations, ceased to exist after the great apostasy of the 2nd and 3rd centuries, are we to say there were no Christians and no salvation until the early 1800s? This study, his whole book, The Traces of the Kingdom, this study will attempt to answer these questions and show that autonomous congregations with like understanding with the Holy Scriptures, have existed through the last millennia, continuing in the pattern set by the congregation that met in Jerusalem on the first Pentecost after the resurrection. This is just really a matter of faith. When we consider all of the verses that we just read, let's look at Hebrews chapter, one and, uh, chapter 11 and verse 1. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. The substance, it's what the faith is what undergirds our beliefs. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Anybody here, you hope to go to heaven? How many people here hope to go to heaven? Nobody's raising their hand. Okay, we're not getting a bus loaded ready to go now, okay? I assume that if you're here present today and you're in your right mind, that you want to go to heaven. Have you ever seen heaven? Your hope is to go to heaven. You haven't seen it. But by faith we know, we know it's there. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Now let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16. Here's the application of verse 1. These all died. Between verse 1 and, and, and verse 13, we have a lot of examples of people who lived by faith and acted upon that. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth, for that they say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to call them their God, and he has prepared for them a city. You know all those passages we read? Johnny mentioned Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 in his verse, and how that the church existed in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. And so we have the church in, in, in God's mind. The planning phase. And then we had the, the time of prophecy. The church existed in prophecy. We read some of the prophecies regarding the church just a moment ago. And then we had the church in preparation during the time of Christ. Ultimately, Jesus dying on the cross to prepare the way for the church to come into the world. 
And at that time, after the resurrection and the ascension, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father, and he's been ruling his kingdom according to the scriptures that we just read. Every day of every year of every century since that time, without exception. Now, you know, those people in the Old Testament, by faith, look to the future. And they were certain that the kingdom was going to be established. They knew it. They were persuaded. Did they ever see that? No. By faith, they had hope. And the faith was the basis, the foundation of that hope. But they never received the promise. Then look at Hebrews 11, 13, uh, 39 and 40. And these all having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. They looked forward in time. And they saw the indestructible church. Can we not look back in time? And see the indestructible church in every generation without exception? Coming all the way up into the present? Do we have the faith of those that lived in the Old Testament? When God says that it's going to be here forever and ever to, and never be destroyed? And it's going to break in pieces other kingdoms? And it wasn't going to be left to itself? That it would be forever and ever and generation to generation. Didn't say it's going to be every other generation. Can we not look back in faith just as they look forward in faith and, and say with confidence that the church is indestructible and that it has been in existence in every generation with believers practicing the pattern of New Testament Christianity? Think about the providence of God, the power of God, the preservation of God. If there was a time since the beginning of the church that the church didn't exist on earth, what does that say about the preserving power of God, the providence of God? That God failed to uphold his promise? If God be for us, who can be against us? Isn't that what Paul asked the brethren at Rome? Let's look at another aspect of this. I want to talk about the body of Christ for just a minute. The body of Christ terminology tells us a lot about the nature of the church. A man's body is inseparable from that man. There has been a lot written and said about whether the body of Christ terminology is metaphorical or ontological. And of course, it's not the purpose of this study to get into the details of that discussion. However, we should note that whether considered metaphorically or ontologically, the body of Christ terminology shows that within the world, Christ and the church are inseparable. And the church is permanently welded together as a body with Jesus Christ as the head. We recognize a man by their body, by his physical appearance, his face, his eyes, his hair, and so forth, those distinguishing features. While we realize that the body is not the man, we cannot think of a person without that person's physical appearance coming to our mind. When we see an old friend, we say, man, you sure have changed. Have you ever seen, just like David said, it was a long time between the time I graduated from school and the time we saw one another in the Philippines. Do you think both of us had changed at least a little bit? Of course we had. Of course we had. What we really mean when we say, haven't you changed, is, is 
how your body has changed in the physical appearance. Your hair has turned white or maybe it turned loose. Your waistline has increased. Your shoulders are stooped a little bit. You walk a little slower. Yeah. We recognize people in that way. Think about this. Close your eyes if you want to. Play along. And think about somebody you haven't seen in a while. Can you think about that person without their faith com face coming to your mind? Can you do that? No. That's because the body and the person go together. Just like the body and the head we talk about the church, go together. You cannot think about Christ and the church as two separate concepts when you're thinking of terms of salvation, of the cross, of the gospel, of worship, and the list could go on. To be in Christ is to be in the church, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in Christ Jesus. All of God's deity is expressed in Jesus. And Jesus now sits at the right hand of God. God's completeness is in Jesus. But so are we made complete in Christ. And God's fullness. He is the head of, the, of all principality and power. And thus we are complete in him. Thus members within the body of Christ is the experience of being in the full harmony with the Godhead and to be in Jesus' church is to be complete. Now let's look at the application. Having said all that, why did I say all that? I said that to ask this question, can a head exist without a body? We've seen the movie The Headless Horseman, right? right? There's a guy without a head, but can a head exist without a body? We know the answer to that, right? No. If there was ever a time when the body, the church, did not exist on the earth, what does that do to the headship of Christ? indestructibility of the church the church is indestructible because its head is indestructible you might as well ask has the head existed the whole time if the head has existed and we have the assurance that it will because of the deity that resides in Christ if the head has existed consistently throughout the ages then so has the body Now let's shift gears and let's talk about the kingdom of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 28, then comes the end, talking about the end of time when Jesus comes back to judge the world in righteousness. Then comes the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. See, Jesus is going to reign until he returns, and then he's going to give the kingdom back to the Father. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. You know, according to some that seem to think that the kingdom didn't exist in every generation throughout all ages, this idea of being a king and reigning was a part-time job. But it says he must reign. Till he has put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he has all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also 
himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Prior to the cross, God, the Father, was on the throne of the kingdom. The kingdom existed in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 11 when the people cried out to Samuel, Give us a king so that we might be like other nations. God told Samuel, They haven't rejected you, but they've rejected me as being king over them. God was their king. But God allowed man to sit on a throne, on his throne, under his authority. The kings that sit on the literal physical throne during the time of, of Israel, they were given temporary delegated authority, but they were still accountable to God. After the cross, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus says, All authority has been given unto me on heaven and on earth. Jesus now has authority. Jesus is now sitting on the throne at the right hand of the Father. And he will do so until the second coming when he judged the world. In order to have a kingdom, you have to have a king. You have to have territory. You have to have law. You have to have subjects. By the way, you guys that like to make sermons, there's your outline. Luke 22 and verse 29, Jesus speaking says, I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me. The kingdom was appointed to Christ. And that king that's over the kingdom now is Jesus. He's the king of kings and lord of lords as we see in 1 Timothy 6 verse 15, Hebrews 7 and verse 1, Revelation 17 verse 14, Revelation 19 and verse 16. So we have a king, but what about the territory? Well, according to Matthew 28 and verse 18, the whole world is the territory. Jesus is king of kings, Lord of lords. He's over all. He has to have a law. James chapter 1 and verse 25 is referred to as the perfect law of liberty. That's the New Testament, the gospel of Christ. And he has to have subjects. And we find the subjects in Colossians 1 and verse 13 where it says that we're translated out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Now let's look at the application again. Can, an, can a kingdom exist without a king? No. Can it exist without a territory? No. Can it exist without a law? No. But some people seem to have a th the idea that the kingdom can exist without subjects because they teach that the, king the kingdom didn't last in every generation there were times when the kingdom didn't exist upon the earth the church is indestructible of course there were subjects what would happen if there was ever a time when there were no subjects what would that be said about the kingship of Jesus Christ? Same principle could be applied to the bride of Christ. Revelation 21 and verse 9. Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the, the lamb's wife. If there was ever a time when the church didn't exist, the bride didn't exist, what of the groom? What are the, and we could keep on with these. These illustrations in the Bible are there for a purpose. And part of that purpose is to demonstrate the indestructibility, the permanence of the church. Jesus can't be a head without a body. He can't be a king without subjects. He can't be a groom without a bride. Now let's talk a little bit about the seed principle. The seed principle. How much time do I got, David? Five minutes? I think I can make it. All life comes only from previous life of its own kind. Pretty simple, right? That's the law of biogenesis. It's the law of biogenesis. Life comes from life and everything reproduces after its own kind. 
Okay? It's stated in Genesis chapter 1, verses 20 through 22, the time of creation. It's restated in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall also reap. Luke chapter 8, verse 11 through 15, the parable of the sower. The seed is the word of God, verse 8. The succession is in the seed. The crop depends on the seed, soil, and cultivation. The church is in the seed, just as the oak is in the acorn. The church needs no succession of officers. By faith, I can look back and see in past generations, according to the scripture, the church has always existed. The church owes its existence to this generation because the seed was planted in good and honest hearts. It took root and bare fruit. In order for the church to succeed and exist in the next generation, in the generation after that, the seed has to be planted. It has to be planted in good soil. It has to be cultivated, made to grow. Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. If we're not doing our job, then what? Then what? I remember a passage back in Esther. God's people fixed to be destroyed. Mordecai. Esther's uncle's trying to get her to go and intercede on behalf of the people with the king. She's afraid to go in because she'd go in uninvited. She could be put to death. Mordecai, in an effort to encourage her, says this. Whether you go in and do this or not, this is just kind of a paraphrase. He says, God will raise up salvation from another place and your house will be destroyed and he goes on to say how do you know that you weren't put in the kingdom at this time and in this place for this purpose john f kennedy asked one time if not us who if not now when the seed is placed in our hands. The future of the kingdom rests on our shoulders. If not us, who? If not now, when? Thank you for your time.